2016 national exam for the chemistry Olympia. This is going to be the multiple choice, the 1 through 60. I'm going to split this up into 10 question increments to kind of keep the time frames reasonable. Uh, but I'm going to go through all the questions. If you look in the link, uh, if you look in the description, you'll find a link to the exam. So you can try it first if you want, or if you just want to see how to do them, that's fine too. Okay. On the exam, you'll find a periodic table. You'll also see these three equations. So as we get to problems that deal with those, those will prop up into the questions. So starting with number one, we have four different chemicals and the question is which of those will require eight moles of O2 to react with one mole of it for complete combustion. So A you should recognize as being a 1 to 5 ratio for C3H8. Uh, B is a 2 to 13 ratio and you've probably worked that equation out before. Hopefully you remember that's not 1 to 8. So really C and D are very similar. C5H10, C5H12, we're looking at an alkene probably or cyclopentane. Uh, and, and so really we can do either one of these and just balance the equation and we'll know the answer. So I'm going to pick D here. C5H12 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. If this is wrong, then we know that the answer is probably C and hopefully we can see that in the question. So we have five CO2s needed and six H2Os. So we don't have any oxygens here, so we have five O2s plus three more O2s or six O's. That would be eight O2s. So I have to keep in mind that the oxygen on the hydrogen on the water is, is singular. Uh, but other than that, we've got our answer. It's D. And C would be off by a little bit because there's H10, it would have been 5 H2O's, it would have been 7.5 O2's. Okay. So number two is also pretty simple. Uh, in this one, one of the key phrasings up here is that it says calcium ions, not chloride ions, because the chlorides come in two per formula unit. Other than that, we're going to do a really simple calculation. We have this many grams of calcium chloride. We're going to divide that by the molar mass. And according to the periodic table on the front of the exam, that comes out to be 110.98. So when we divide that, we get 0 0.06758 moles of calcium chloride. Now, that is also how many moles of calcium there are double that amount and we would have the moles of chloride. All we need to do from there is divide that answer by 0 0.350 liters and we'll get our concentration and it ends up being 0.193 molar. So our answer to 2 would be B. Okay, number 3, a little trickier but nothing too crazy. Uh, we want to take this 0.797 grams of compound and subtract the 0.422 grams of this unknown element Z. And that comes out to be 0.375 grams of oxygen. We then want to convert that into moles, so we're going to divide that by 16. And that comes out to be 0.0234 moles of oxygen in that compound made. And then it tells us that for our formula Z2O3, the three moles of oxygen in the compound correlate to two moles of the unknown element Z. And that comes out to 0 0.0156 moles of Z. So we take our 0.422 grams. We're going to divide that by the 0 0.0156 moles. And we get our molar mass. It turns out to be 27, which of course is the molar mass of aluminum. And our answer there is A. Okay, number four, uh, also pretty simple. A lot of you probably worked this out without even writing anything down. Uh, we, I'm going to do a BCA chart here just to kind of make sure everyone has the whole thing down. Uh, we're looking at five liters of this, and we have three liters of this, and zero of this to start. Okay, we're going to drop by five liters here, by 2.5 liters here, and go up by five liters here for after of zero, 0.5 in excess, and five of product. So our total is 5.5 liters, that answer is A. That's a pretty simple thing. Some key things there, your liters are proportional according to stoichiometry in the same way that moles are because they specify that the temperature and pressure are constant. And so really simple analysis, we're gonna have a little bit of excess reagent in our product, total is 5.5. Okay, number five is also pretty simple. Um, in this one, we're looking at 0.04 moles of hypochlorite. It's 
going to react with peroxide in a one-to-one -one ratio, so we need 0 0.04 moles of peroxide to get everything to react. And it's one molar peroxide. So they add different amounts and then they plot it. Okay? Now, 40 milliliters of one molar is going to give us that 0 0.04. So 40 milliliters is our point where we reach kind of equal amounts of equimolar amounts of the chemicals. Okay? So at 40 milliliters, we should see some change in our graph, which eliminates A. Okay, here we see it, here we see it, and here we see it. But then what should we see after that? Well, if we had 50 milliliters, because we have ran out of hypochlorite at that point, we're not going to produce any additional gas, but we will still produce the same amount of gas. So D is our correct answer. As we're adding more and more peroxide, we're reacting more and more to produce the oxygen gas, and then at that point, we no longer produce any oxygen gas, because at this point, our hypochlorite ions are now the limiting reagent. So we just produce a constant amount. So D would be our answer there. Pen just exploded. All right, number six is a concept that really hasn't been in AP chemistry or in IB chemistry for a while. So you might not have seen this before, but this is uh, a colligative property. It's called um, osmotic pressure. And the idea is, is that when you have a partition semi-permeable membrane, that, that membrane will let through water molecules but not be soluble. So the glucose is too large to make it through here, like a cell wall or something like that. And what happens then is that any of those particles near this membrane will not travel through, and they also prevent a water molecule from traveling through. So it slows down the rate that water goes through this. And here's the key idea. On this one, the key is, is that sodium chloride, when you put it into water and it dissolves, you end up with two particles for every one formula unit. So since we have the same moles of glucose and NaCl, we're going to end up with double the amount of particles on the NaCl side as we would on the glucose side. So what's going to happen is this side is going to see the water transferring over to here slow down, but this side is going to see it slow down even more. And so we have a net flow of water in towards the sodium chloride side, and so the sodium chloride side is going to go up and the glucose side is going to go down. Okay. Now as that goes up, we have an increased weight of the water, that's going to increase that rate to go back to being equal. This rate is slowing down because it has less water, and eventually you get an equilibrium where we have different heights. Okay, So there's, there's an osmotic pressure here from that, from that buildup that's equivalent to the differences in, in the molality of particles. And so B is our answer here. We would expect the NaCl with more particles to increase uh, in water level and both C and D see a decrease. A is the same, which would be the case if we didn't have this Van Hoff difference between the glucose and the sodium chloride. But we do, so B is our answer. Okay, number seven, uh, we're looking for molar mass. Anytime you're doing an experiment for molar mass, you need to be able to find grams and moles of a given amount of the chemical. So melting point, really can't find either one of those. That is an identifying feature of organic compounds, but it's not it's not precise enough to actually identify it. Maybe if you had like a list of three chemicals and they have varying melting points, but that's not the case here. So that's not our answer. Heat of combustion, we can figure out how many kilojoules per gram we can find, but we don't really have the molar mass, so we can't turn that into grams per mole. So that's not going to work. In solubility, we're gonna find, we can measure the mass, I guess, but you can't find the moles from that. And also, like A, that is an identifying feature perhaps, but not, not precise enough to actually base your experiment on. Okay, and also it's possible that an organic compound is not even soluble in water. So we're then drawn to B. In B we have the melting point depression, and so from there we can find the molality, okay? Um, because the temperature change of the freezing temperature is going to be proportional to the molality times a constant, or proportional will be equal to. Um, and so we can find the molality if we know the uh, grams of the solute and solvent, then we can turn that into moles of the solute, and then we also can measure the mass of that, so that gives us grams and moles of the chemical, and therefore B would be our choice. Okay, so that's a common experiment that used to be done back when colligative properties would have been more of a topic in AP Chem or IB Chemistry. Uh, number eight is a qualitative analysis question. Of these four ions, you're adding HCl to it, Okay, so HCl, of course, is going to cause silver to precipitate. Manganese chloride, barium chloride, copper chloride, all soluble. Okay, then they filter that, and then they add sulfuric acid. 
So sulfuric acid would precipitate with silver, and it would also precipitate, of course, with barium. And so, which is the second precipitate? Well, it's either barium sulfate or it's a mixture of the two. Then we have to go look at the amounts. Here we have 0 0.01 molar concentrations of these four, potentially, and then we're adding one molar HCl. So we have a very large excess of the chloride, and that's going to remove this silver from solution to the point where we're not going to form a precipitate of that. And that gives us our answer of B. It would just be the barium sulfate. Okay, number nine is another qualitative question. Uh, here we're looking at hydroxide and it dissolves, so we're looking at a complexation reaction. So our alkaline ones are not going to be forming complexes, the barium or the magnesium, uh, even in an excess state. Aluminum and silver both do form complex ions, um, and so then you're tasked with choosing between the two. For me, when I saw this question, I know that I see silver is something that reacts with excess chloride to form a complex ion. And I've also seen it as something that reacts with ammonia. I've never seen hydroxide. But I also know that aluminum, in particular, is really commonly known to uh, precipitate out, I'm sorry, dissolve with complexation reactions using hydroxide. In particular, that's because the ore from bauxite, that's how we extract the aluminum oxide from that is we react it with hydroxide and that dissolves it and so therefore I would lean towards B in this and that ends up being the choice uh, and so perhaps silver just doesn't have a complex reaction with the hydroxide maybe there's something in those ligands that just leads to a precipitate and then nothing else okay. all right then number 10 I think is a very challenging question so here's here's how I like to think about this we are looking at some unknown weak monoprotic acid. It's a carboxylic acid, okay? And we want to measure its molar mass. So we're going to measure how many grams of it there are, and how many moles of it there are. So the grams we just measure, we're going to assume that that's accurate based on the reading of this question. But the moles is going to be inaccurate. So there's two things that can happen for that. If the moles, if we underestimate it, that means that we're going to come up with a molar mass that's too high. Okay, which will lead to a molar mass that's too high. So if we underestimate the moles, that's going to be what we get. If we overestimate the moles, then our molar mass is going to be too low. In that case, we're not going to deal with that. So then we look at scenarios. In number one, the KHP is partially hydrated. So what that means is we think we're overestimating the amount of KHP. Okay? And that means that we're going to overestimate the concentration of hydroxide in our standardized solution, which means we're going to overestimate the moles of HA. So if we overestimate the moles, that means our molar mass is going to go down, and therefore that is not a correct choice. Okay, for the second one, this one is really hard to think through. So we do the standardization and we get the correct amount. But then after we're done, so we start off with an accurate portrayal of the hydroxide concentration. After that's done, it absorbs some carbon dioxide, which then reacts with some of that NaOH. Okay, so now we think we're putting in a concentration that's here, when really it's down here. Okay, so we are overestimating the hydroxide again. So we overestimate the hydroxide. Now this is not starting with KHP. This first part was done correctly, but here we added an error in that leads to the same track. If we overestimate the hydroxide concentration, we're going to overestimate the acid moles, which means we're again in this blue scenario, the molar mass is too low, so neither of these works, and D would be our choice.